We know every year there's a flu season, but like other seasons, the details are hard to predict. This year, the flu came early and a lot of people who got shots still got the flu. Turns out the flu virus is a constantly moving target and flu shots sometimes take aim and miss. Now that can be an inconvenience or it can become a serious public health problem. Worst case scenario, the fall of 1918. There was a new kind of flu that killed more people worldwide in a few months than the Great War. Our story tonight is about a hero in the war on the flu. St. Louis Health Commissioner, Dr. Max Starkloff, the grandfather of the Max Starkloff who founded Paraquat. He took extreme and sometimes unpopular measures. Imagine, he closed churches, but he stood his ground and saved a lot of people. The big news in October of 1918 was the Allied offensive, the Battle of the Argonne Forest. Americans, St. Louisans, were there fighting and dying and hoping this war would be over soon. But there was another battle, another war going on, an invasion that would kill more people than the Great War, here in St. Louis and around the world. A, not quite a one-off event, but a rare event. We've had perhaps a half a dozen pandemics that we know about going back to the 1700s. On October 4th, the enemy had arrived in the city. The papers reported the first confirmed cases of the flu. Normally, that wouldn't be news. People got the flu back then or the grip, just like we do. They didn't know much about viruses, about how the flu virus is constantly mutating and changing. But they did know that this one was different. They called it the Spanish flu. Why the 1918 flu was highly transmissible is not well worked out. St. Louis University's Dr. Alan Zelikoff. In terms of the symptoms, it was far, far worse. And in terms of the uh, age of the population that it affected, it tended to affect young people, say late teenage years through early 30s. St. Louis's health commissioner, Dr. Max Starkloff, knew what the flu was doing in other cities, and when it got here, he went straight to the board of aldermen. They passed a bill requiring doctors to report all cases of influenza. And as a reportable disease, the mayor could then proclaim an epidemic. And that gave broad powers to the health commissioner to close public places where the disease could be spread. Mayor Henry Keel said nothing yet warranted such drastic action. Starkloff probably knew better. In Boston, for example, in September of 1918, there was a sudden spike, and it wasn't long until Philadelphia got hit. It was only a week or two later that cases appeared in Pittsburgh and then in Chicago. He knew it was coming because he read the papers and he was on the phone with his colleagues in, in Chicago and on the East Coast. He knew it was coming. He watched it march across the country. He expected it to arrive. He predicted practically the day it arrived. In just a few days, the flu was spreading fast through St. Louis and people were starting to die. Starkloff didn't mess around with half measures. On October 7th, he ordered the immediate closing of theaters, moving picture shows, schools, pool and billiard halls, lodges and society meetings, dance halls, conventions, public funerals, and churches. He got support from church leaders who encouraged and instructed members on how they could worship at home. Just the empirical observation of people gathering together who coughed, forget about the organism for a second, was enough to put into effect public health measures here that were extraordinarily effective if you compare St. Louis to uh, other cities. Soldiers returning from the war in Europe undoubtedly were bringing the Spanish flu home to the East Coast ports and then bringing it west. But it might well have been an American soldier who brought the flu to Europe in the first place. Dr. Zelikoff suggests a better name for the Spanish flu might be the Haskell County flu. So no one knows where it began, but I think the weight of evidence is that it began in Kansas. What's believed to have happened is that the organism transmitted directly from the natural host, which are birds, directly from that, uh, that host into humans. What makes influenza both so fascinating and so pesky is that the genome, its genetic structure, is on eight separate strands. To the best of my knowledge, there's no other virus that has this. So that means if some animal or bird is infected with two different 
influenza viruses, meaning one influenza virus with eight strands and another influenza virus with eight strands at the same time. There's nothing to say that, that that virus, which must live inside of cells, can't reproduce inside of those cells and some of those genes swap. So out comes an influenza virus that now has new properties that had never been seen before, perhaps. And it might have been an infected Haskell County farm boy who reported for duty at Fort Riley, Kansas. The flu was especially a problem in military posts, like Jefferson Barracks, where men were crowded together in barracks and in hospital wards. St. Louis Congressman Jacob Meeker went to Jefferson Barracks on October 9th to discuss the need for more masks for those taking care of the sick. A week later, he was dead at the age of 40. On his deathbed, Meeker married his secretary, Alice Redmond. Everyone there in the hospital room was wearing masks. So many of the photographs of that deadly season are people in masks, nurses, police, teachers. Even the Washington University football team donned masks for this photo, but they may not have played. So many of the sporting events were being canceled as well. And it was working, but every time it looked like the flu was easing up, cases would spike again. And Starkloff ordered more closings and restrictions. He limited store hours, he banned children under 16 from going into businesses, and police officers kept people moving along and broke up small gatherings. In November, with the war coming to an end, Starkloff used the upcoming armistice celebration on Monday, November 11th, to create a four-day holiday closing all businesses. This was costing a lot of people a lot of money. The Chamber of Commerce objected, and despite the economic consequences and political pressure, Starkloff still had the backing of Mayor Keel. Who recognized that uh, this was going to be a disaster if they didn't get ahead of the epidemic curve, and they did. The flu epidemic continued the rest of the year before it ran its course. Starkloff didn't lift the closings and restrictions until December 28th of 1918. In those few months, the Spanish flu took the lives of 1,700 St. Louisans. But without Starkloff's quick and determined actions, it could easily have been twice that many. I think because he was just phenomenally convincing and he would not rest until he got the opportunity to enforce what he knew was the right thing to do. And it worked. It definitely worked. Despite all of our advances in science, a flu epidemic, even a pandemic, could happen again. But here's what I was wondering. Would we today be willing to accept such drastic measures, restrictions, to prevent its spread? Well, look at Toronto with SARS in 2003. That was a dramatic success story. The community came together. People who were ill, even if they were mildly ill, self-isolated. And more importantly, the community supported them. They brought them their mail. They brought them books to read. They brought them food so that they uh, did not have to go out shopping. So it can work. And I think the single best demonstration we've had of that, at least in the West, is the Toronto SARS uh, example of 2003, a dramatic public health success story.